In this video, we're going to work through a hypothesis test for the mean, or what gets known as the one sample t test. Okay, we're going to use this as a foundation for what is a hypothesis test in general. Okay, and most of the ones that follow we'll do using software rather than by hand. So we're going to work with this example here. Suppose we know that the mean BMI in the United States in 2008 was 25.3. And we'd like to know if it's increased. So in 2018, we take a sample of 25 individuals, a random sample of 25 from the population. We find a sample mean of 27.8 and a sample standard deviation of 6. Now, while this estimate is a little bit above what it was in the past, we'd like to know, is it significantly higher? Okay, and what we mean by that is, suppose that the mean in 2018 came out to be 25.6. Would you be convinced that it's really significantly higher than 25.3? Probably not, right? Our sample is based on only 25 individuals. What if our sample mean came out to be 26.3? Would you be convinced? What if it came out to be 31.5? Yeah, that's probably big enough that you're convinced it's significantly different. Right? So we need to decide how far is far enough. So to do this, we start by creating what we call a null and an alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis we label H0 and the alternative we label HA. The alternative is usually what we're interested in trying to show and the null is some statement we're going to assume to be true until convinced otherwise. So here we're going to start by assuming that the population mean in 2018 hasn't changed. Okay, it's still 25.3 versus the alternative that the mean in 2018 is larger than what it was in the past, okay, that there has been an increase. When doing these hypothesis tests, we start by assuming the null hypothesis to be true. Okay. Let's talk about why we do this. When assuming that the null is true, then we know what we expect to show up when we collect the sample of data. If the mean BMI hasn't changed from 2008 to 2018, we'd expect our sample mean to be about 25.3. Okay. And then we can compare what we saw in our sample with what we would expect to see if our null is true. If instead we tried to start by saying, let's assume the alternative is true, let's assume there has been an increase, we don't know exactly what we'd expect our sample mean to be in 2018. Right? All we know is if there has been an increase, we'd expect it to be something larger than 25.3, but we don't know exactly what. So we start by assuming our null is true and then see if we can provide evidence against it. In order to do this, we're going to want to compare what we got in our sample to what we hypothesize we should get if our null hypothesis is true. So, in order to do this, we can think about the sampling distribution under the assumption that the null is true. If our null hypothesis is true, we expect our sample mean to be mu naught, the hypothesized mean of 25.3. We ended up with a sample estimate of 27.8. We'd like to work out how likely was it to get this estimate, assuming our null is true. On one note worth, make, um, worth making before we carry on, this alternative here we're working with is a one-sided alternative. In a following video, we'll talk about one-sided versus two-sided tests and the slight difference between those two. Now, um, we can think about standardizing this as we did before. Okay, we're calculating our test statistic. And this looks at how far is the estimate we got in a sample from the hypothesized value in terms of the standard error of the estimate. In our example, how far is the 27.8 from the hypothesized value of 25.3 in terms of a standard error? And this is going to come out to be 
2.08. Okay, so again, here the estimate that we got in our sample is about two standard errors above what we'd expect if our null is true, if there has been no change. And in order to do this test, we need to make um, essentially the same set of assumptions that we um, made when constructing confidence intervals. Um, so let's just put those down briefly. To do this, we're going to assume we have a simple random sample, independent observations, and we have a large sample size or the individuals are approximately normally distributed. Okay, now if we carry through um, and work this out, we can see that the estimate that we got is 2.08 standard errors above what we'd expect if the null hypothesis is true. Okay. Now, just redrawing this here, okay. the T distribution, okay, or the Z, as noted earlier, technically we should be using a T distribution. I'm going to use Z or the standard normal just to simplify the values we look up in the table. Okay, and later on we'll be doing all this with software, so we won't need to worry about T or Z. Software will get us the exact value. What's the area above 2.08? Again, if we work that out using Z, it's going to give us... 1.9%. And just as a reminder, if you wanted to find the exact value using the T distribution, which is technically the correct way to do it, it's going to come out to be 2.4%. Okay, so again, not a big difference in a practical sense, um, but just using the Z value is going to allow us to focus a bit more on the concepts. And using a T table, you can't find the exact um, P value. You can do it with software, but again, we don't want to focus our attention on how do we find some exact number from a table or a piece of software? We want to focus on the concept of what is this actually telling us. Okay. So let's talk about what are, what are these um, telling us. Uh, I guess worth mentioning, because I don't think I've said this explicitly, is here we label the p-value. Um, so this here tells us what's the probability of getting an estimate like this. What's the probability of getting a sample mean of 27.8 or more if our null is true? What's the probability of seeing an increase this big or bigger if really there's been no change from 2008 to 2018? Okay, so let's write that down. If the null hypothesis is true, if there's been no change from 2008 to 2018, the probability of getting an estimate or a sample mean greater or equal to 27.8 is roughly 1.9 percent. Okay, so what we can conclude from there is that one of two things must have happened. Either, either the null hypothesis is true and we just ended up with some rare data. So the null is true, there has been no change in BMI, mean BMI, and we just got a rare sample that's going to show up about 2% of the time. Or, the null hypothesis is not true. And again, the reason for this is that if the null were true, what we saw in our sample wouldn't be very likely to show up. So. In reality, we don't know which one of these is true. We don't know, is the null false and BMI has increased on average? Or has there been no change and we just got um, some rare data? We got something that made it appear as though it's been an increase, but in fact there hasn't. We don't know which one is true, but we can decide which one is more likely. The decision we're going to make, since our p-value here is small, okay, we'll, use, um, we'll talk a bit more later about what we mean by small or large. But because it's small, we're going to reject our null hypothesis and say we have evidence to believe that the alternative is true. We have evidence to believe that mean BMI has increased. So when our p-value is small, like it is here, 
what that tells us is if our null is true, what we saw in our sample wouldn't be very likely to show up. Therefore, we think it's probably not true. Suppose on the other side, suppose the p-value came out to be 55%. What that would tell us is if our null is true, we're going to see what we saw in our sample about 50% of the time. Okay, 55% of the time. So we're not really willing to rule out the null. Um, a note, we'll talk a bit more about this as, as we progress through the course, but failing to reject the null hypothesis isn't the same as proving it to be true. Similar to um, in a court, failing to prove someone guilty is not the same as proving them innocent. Right? That's why we say we find them not guilty. We don't find them innocent. Some guidelines, okay, and these are only guidelines. I don't want to get too stuck on them. Is that if the p-value is less than some alpha, Okay, usually 5%, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is large, okay, greater or equal to some alpha, again, usually 5%, we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. Um, now, a few things I want to point out. This is just a guideline. Okay, the values for alpha usually range um, anywhere between 10% to 1%, 5% being the most common. And why 5% is the most common? Um, well, this comes down to uh, Ronald Fisher, okay, a fairly famous statistician. I'm sure you've heard his name in, in other areas. Um, what he said um, when, when this stuff was, was in its early days was that making a false rejection of the null hypothesis 1 in 20 times is an acceptable rate. Okay, 1 in 20 times is the 5%. It's a fairly arbitrary choice, but of course we want our false rejection rate to be fairly low. Now one thing I do want to focus on, this 5% cutoff, here this alpha cutoff, is just a guide. Okay. Um, I'd suggest read the American Statistical Association statement on p-values to get a, um, a deep discussion of this. Um, but what I'd like to say is we don't want to boil things down to um, one number helping us make a decision of reject or don't reject. Okay, in my opinion, a p-value of 6% and a p-value of 4% are pretty much the same. A few other things that are worth talking about are the idea of statistical, okay, or clinical versus scientific significance. Okay. Now, in the English language, the term significant means important or meaningful. In statistical lingo, a significant difference means a difference that we believe is real and not due to chance. Okay, so small things can end up being statistically significant. What we'd like to focus on is not just statistical significance, but is the change here that we've seen meaningful? Okay, so here we've seen an increase of about 2.5. Okay, and this we're going to start to call this the effect size. Is that a meaningful change? So now a reminder, we can always do things like build confidence intervals to help try and give us an idea of what do we think the effect size is, um, rather than just talking about um, statistical significance. So let's just quickly remind ourselves we can make a 95% confidence interval for the estimate. Let's go from the estimate plus or minus roughly two standard errors. And if you work that out, you're going to find the confidence interval comes out to be 25.4 up to 30.2. Okay. We're 95% confident the true mean in 2018, mean BMI, is somewhere in this interval. Now using this, we can see the lowest value we're willing to accept is still above the mean in 2008. Okay, so that gives us some evidence there has been a statistically significant increase. And we can look at the confidence interval to decide is it a meaningful increase. At the lower end, right, the lowest value we're willing to accept, 25.4, that's only 0.1 above the mean in 2008. So at that end, it might not be a meaningful, clinically meaningful increase. At the higher end, the 30.2, that's 4.9 above the mean in 2008. 
that might be clinically meaningful. Okay, so just a reminder that um, statistical significance and scientific or clinical significance are um, two different things. So what's important to note here is while doing a one sample t-test isn't always the most useful scientific application, it really lays the foundation for how does hypothesis testing work, what is a null and alternative, what's a test statistic, um, what's a p-value, and how are they used. Okay. All hypothesis tests in some way compare the estimate you got in a sample of data to what you hypothesized it should have been if some null hypothesis was true. Okay. Coming up, we're going to talk about um, errors that can be made. Right? We might reject our null and in reality we shouldn't have, or we might fail to reject it when in reality we should have rejected it. So we'll talk a little bit about the types of errors that can be made and how often we'll make them, as well as the related concept of power. Thanks for watching our video. Subscribe to our channel, like our videos. Stick around guys, because we got lots more.